Greetings. My name is Terry Covey and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you and have a great day. Have your Bibles be turning to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. I have one of the pew Bibles right here I'm using this morning, and that's on page 890. That's one of the black Bibles right in front of you there, right beside the songbook. So I'd encourage you, if you didn't bring your Bible, to get one of those, because I think it's just so much more powerful when we actually read from, from God's Word, not just hear it, but we actually see it. We learn so much more. So if you're using one of the black Bibles, the, page, the one I have is page 890. As a lot of you already know, this, well, opening uh, ceremonies Friday night for the Olympics, and then yesterday the Olympics started. And I don't know if you watch the Olympics or not, but it's something we really watch as a family. We really enjoy watching both the summer and the winter Olympics we have for years. We don't watch a whole lot of TV because there's really not a whole lot to watch on TV. So I guess that's one of the reasons we've often really looked forward to watching a lot of the Olympics. We like sports and we like the competition and we like to watch all of that and and to be honest with you every time I watch it and if an American wins the gold and they're playing the Star Spangled Banner I wish that I was the one standing there don't you just for what an incredible and I, and I think I can't remember what country it was and I'm sure everyone feels that way about their country it was another country I just turned on the television there yesterday afternoon and it was on and uh, there was another country and I don't even know what the event was. It was just the closing, the ceremony there where the man was receiving. And, and he was from another country, and he had won the gold medal. And, as they, and I couldn't understand the words. Or anything, I didn't understand anything. But that man was about to break down and cry. He was just knowing that his country, that he had done something for his country, and not only that he was winning that gold medal, but that he was bringing honor to his country was an overwhelming experience. And so I, I envy those athletes uh, who get to compete and those especially who get to win. You know, I will never win, obviously, an Olympic gold medal. But the Bible tells me in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, that I'm in a competition, and there's some other passages as well, that tells me that there is a possibility, I think, for me to, to receive recognition, to win a prize. And it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Paul is referring back to chapter 11, Moses, Abraham, all those people of faith. He says, wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about by so, so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, yet is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The writer of Hebrews is telling us that, that we're in a race. And the race that we're in, each of us, we're all, if you're a believer today, you're in a race. It is a race that God has given to you. It is a race that God has set out before you. And God is encouraging you to run that race with endurance so that at the end He can reward you. He can recognize your race, what you've done, and He can reward you. Not because you came in first necessarily in this race, but because you ran, the King James uses the word patience. There are several different words that can be translated as patience. The particular word right here means to remain under the load. It means endurance. Oftentimes we as Christians, we, we, difficulties come into our lives. Physical and financial and family and social and, I mean, just that's just broad categories, but just so many difficulties come into our lives. And we have the tendency, when that happens to us as a Christian, we have the tendency to complain. We have the tendency to want to get out of that race. We think that God is against us because we're in this race and suddenly we're having to go uphill. And it's a struggle. We feel like the race ought to be at least level ground, if not downhill with the wind at our back. 
And when we're in this race and suddenly we come to a part of our race, what I'm talking about, when we come to a part in our life, a particular season in our life that's maybe difficult for us to go through, we want to complain, we want to think that God is against us, but the Bible teaches us that this is a part of the race this is a part of, the, of God's will for our life. This is a part of the race that he has set out before us and he wants us to run by his strength, his grace, so that we will have the endurance to run that race and not quit. The Christian life is not a sprint. Years ago, uh, when I was in high school and I went out for track there for a year or two and, and uh, I was pretty fast. You know, I could run pretty fast for a short distance. And I remember one time I was in a relay, and I, I had the lead-off leg of that relay, and I started out, and I mean, I was burning them, man. I was just, I was so far ahead of everyone else there. And then all of a sudden, it was like my thighs got so tight, it was like concrete. Now, I could sprint a short distance, but I didn't have endurance. The Christian life is not a sprint. The Christian life is a marathon. The Christian life is a marathon, and it takes great endurance. It takes great physical endurance to run a physical marathon. It takes great spiritual endurance to run a spiritual marathon. And what God is looking for, he's looking for people who won't give up, people who won't quit, who when they hit the wall, you know, a lot of Christians, we talk about, you've heard that phrase before, physical runners, and they're running this marathon and they hit the wall. Well, what's hitting the wall? Hitting the wall is when their side is hurting and everything, and they just want to quit. And if a guy quits, he's not going to win, is he? You want to know something? There are a whole lot of Christians because they really do not have the spiritual fortitude or maturity. When they hit the wall spiritually, they want to quit. And the Christians who quit when they hit the wall spiritually will not receive the recognition from the Lord. Now, you're not running for your salvation. You're not running to earn your salvation. But because you are saved, God has now put you in this race, and He wants to supply you with the strength called His grace to run it. And he's looking for people, even when they hit the wall, they keep running. Jesus said this at the very close of Scripture. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. No one in the Bible spoke more about rewards than Jesus. Read through the Gospels and look for the word reward. Jesus was always telling a parable. Jesus was always saying something. He's talking about even if you give a cup of cold water in his name, there's a reward. Jesus was always trying to motivate his followers to stay steadfast, to follow, to run with endurance because Jesus promised a reward for those who will stick it out, who will stay faithful and true and run that race with endurance. And so that's what we're studying about right now as far as our follower, being a follower of Christ, the, the Christian race. Now, if you have a, a uh, bulletin today, on the back of that bulletin, there's another little outline that you can use to fill in. There's some blanks that you can fill in today and places for you to take notes. Again, just as a way of review, the point number one is this, is our accountability to God. The Bible teaches us that every individual that God has ever created will be accountable to him both the saved and the unsaved. The Bible teaches us that the non-believer, the non-Christian, will stand accountable to God at the very end of time at a judgment that is often called the great white throne judgment. This judgment, at this point in time, the Bible says that God has books, and from these books, God has a record of every sin that man has ever committed, outwardly and inwardly as well. And the Bible says every man will be judged according to his works. And the, the, the criteria... That what God is going after in this particular judgment is the issue of sin. The non-believer is accountable for their sin. Even as I was studying that, I thought about that this week. What a sad thing that will be for an individual who went through this life and they stiff-armed God. They rejected God all through their life because they tried to do it their own way. And now suddenly they're before God and they have the opportunity. Do you hear a high pitch? Just me? Okay. I was afraid it was coming out over the speaker there. Uh, they will have the, the, I lost my train of thought with that high pitch, but they, they will be accountable. They wanted to resist God all through their life, and now 
They're actually without God. They have to stand one-on-one -on -one before God and to be accountable for their sins individually. Yet it does not have to be that way. Jesus said this, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God doesn't want an individual. Anyone who has to stand there individually before God and be accountable individually for their sins, they'll not survive. They're going to be judged because we've all sinned and they're going to be cast into, the Bible says, a lake of fire. But it doesn't have to be that way. Christ bore our judgment on the cross. So the non-believer is accountable at the great white throne judgment, but the believer is accountable as well. And look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Turn there with me to a passage in 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, if you're using one of the Pew Bibles, it's on page 854. 854. Second Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible teaches us that the Christian has to stand accountable before God as well and in a judgment that is going to be called, sometimes it's called the judgment seat of Christ. The particular Greek word there is bima, so sometimes it's called the bima seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Paul is writing to Christians. He's writing to the church. And notice what he says in verse 9. Wherefore we labor. You want to, let me stop there for a second. You want to know, I was looking at this this week. The Apostle Paul referred to the Christian life as labor or work in every single letter that he wrote. He referred to the Christian life as labor. He referred to people who were serving in the Christian walk as fellow laborers. Because what Paul's trying to emphasize here is that it takes effort. It takes effort to run the race. It will take effort to be someone who will receive recognition in the end. Someone who just drifts through life, someone who doesn't invest Anything in their Christianity, they think, well, I'm saved, and that's all that I care about. That individual will receive no recognition, receive no reward in the end before, when they stand before the Lord because they put forth no effort. I like that one, that guy that beat Michael Phelps yesterday. I don't remember his name now, but he beat Michael Phelps last night in a swimming event. And there's a commercial, I think it's, I don't know if it's MasterCard or something like that, a commercial, and the guy's jumping off the shore in New York, and it's kind of like depicting that he's, he swims all the way from New York to London. Of course, he doesn't do that. But he says, you know, he says you can't, he says you can't dream your way to the gold. You can't wish your way to the gold. You can't even buy the gold. And I thought, how true that is. Just wishing that you'll receive recognition from the Lord will not guarantee you receiving recognition from the Lord. Only the people who put forth the effort. And Paul wanted to receive that recognition, so he said, verse 9, wherefore we labor that whether we're here and present or absent, we may be acceptable or pleasable to Christ. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That phrase judgment seat is the Greek word bima, the bima seat of Christ, because everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Even the believer has to stand accountable before the Lord for what they are doing with their life. Some people really are, they're very opposed to calling this bema the judgment seat or judgment because they believe and they're rightfully so. I had a professor in college who did not like to call this a judgment because he says a Christian will not have to stand at the judgment. Well, it is true. A Christian will not have to stand before God to be judged for their sins and, con and be condemned for their sins. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there's therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I will not have to stand before God to be judged whether or not I'm worthy to go to heaven. I'll not have to stand before God to be judged whether or not I sinned for God to punish me. There's no punishment in this judgment, but I will stand before God and the Bible calls it a judgment. I will stand before God to give an account. And the issue there for the non-Christian, the issue is sin. The issue for the Christian will be stewardship. What is stewardship? A steward is someone who is like a servant who's been entrusted with the responsibility and care of what belongs to another. Some of you, if you're an employer, and let's say that you you're, have to leave the job there for a while and you have to go to town, you have to do something else and you've got some people working for you and you've given them equipment. Maybe they're going to use part of your equipment while you're gone. Well, in essence, they are a steward 
of yours. They're a steward. They're responsible to manage what you've given them, entrusted them. They're responsible to use the, the equipment properly. They're responsible to work. They're responsible to be productive. And eventually you're going to come back from town. Eventually you're going to come back and you're going to check up on what they've done. Well, that's what the Bible says God is doing with us. God has given us the Word. God has given us the Holy Spirit. God has given us the church. God has given us grace. God has given us so many opportunities. God has just poured out, Peter says, everything that would pertain to life and godliness. And now we're stewards. We are responsible to take care of and to manage and to use what God has entrusted us with. I kind of did a comparison. A lot of people are confused between the great white throne and the bema. So I kind of laid this out, and it's on the back of your bulletin there, and you can see here on the PowerPoint, I tried to kind of lay it out for you so that we can put the two side by side, and you can see some of the differences. Now, this great white throne is in Revelation chapter 20. The Bible teaches us very clearly this, the very last thing to happen as far as the history of the world will go. It's at the end of time. The people that will stand there at that judgment, the Bible calls them the dead because they're dead spiritually. They're without spiritual life. The issue there at that judgment will be sin. There is no reward promised to them, only condemnation. No individual will stand there. It's, God doesn't have a, a scale, a balance, trying to weigh the good against the bad. That's not in Scripture. The Bible says that even one sin disqualifies a person from entering into heaven. And the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there's no reward there, only condemnation. And the penalty at this judgment will be eternity in a lake of fire that the Bible calls hell. Now, let's lay the Bema seat right beside that and examine how it compares to that. The Bema seat is at least 1,000 years earlier. And later on in another message, I'll explain why I'm saying that. The participants there at this Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ are not sinners. It's not the dead, but it's saints. The issue here is not being judged for our sin, whether or not we're worthy to go to heaven. The issue here is stewardship. There is possibility, not a guarantee, but there is possibility of reward for the people who have who've been faithful, the people who have run with endurance. The penalty there will not be a loss of salvation, but the penalty there, the Bible warns us that there's the possibility of losing our rewards. And so the Christian life really is a very serious issue. We have the tendency sometimes, and I think if there's anything I'm trying to emphasize at this particular point in these messages, we, we preach and we teach grace here at this church because the Bible preaches and teaches grace. And so we're much on grace because the Bible is much on grace. You cannot earn your salvation. It's by the grace of God. But one of the, the problems with that is that we have the tendency, and what makes us have this tendency is our fallen nature. We have the tendency to think, okay, whew, because I'm saved by grace, that lets me off the hook, and now I can live any way that I want to live. But the Bible doesn't teach that. And, that, and we're not new in that. Paul, even in his day, he answered a question. Some people said, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, well, what difference does it make if I sin? It's just grace. And you know what Paul answered to that question? God forbid. God forbids someone who'd been delivered from this sin to continually to willfully walk in this sin. What the Bible encourages us now because we have everything that is needful. As I've said before, I'll say it again. If anyone, should be accountable for how they're living their life. It should be the Christian. The non-Christian has nothing to help them live for God. They have a fallen nature. They do not, they're spiritually dead. They do not understand the Word of God. They do not have the Holy Spirit. They're nothing. The Bible calls them aliens. <laughs> but the Christian has a new nature. The book of Ezekiel says. The Christian has a new heart. The Christian has the Holy Spirit dwelling within him. The Christian has the Word of God. The Christian has the church. The Christian has everything that the Christian could possibly ever need if the Christian will just call upon those things and implement them in his life so that through them God can enable him to live the victorious Christian life, to actually one day stand before the Lord and hear the Lord say, well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So let's talk about the judgment seat of Christ. Point number two. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. There are many, many passages that we could look and we could study to try to understand this. Page 842 in the Pew Bible. 
1 Corinthians chapter 3, I think, is, is probably a good of overview, helps us understand especially this particular part, what it's about and what's going to happen here at this judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul will pick up on verse 13 here in the middle of his discussion. And he says in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 3, Every man's work shall be man made manifest. The word there, manifest, means it shall be revealed. Actually, the word means there that light shall be shed upon it. It will be exposed in the brilliancy of heaven's glory. Nothing will be hidden. Every man's work shall be revealed, made manifest, for the day, that day of that judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema, shall declare it because that man's work shall be revealed by fire, the Bible says. And the fire shall try or test or examine every man's work of what sort of what kind it is. If any man's work, that is, this is what he's done here on this earth, if his work abides after it's been tested by fire, any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, it says he, that man, shall receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now that very last part of verse 15 explains to us, you're not going to lose your salvation at this judgment. Your salvation is not based upon your works. Your salvation is based upon the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But your recognition in heaven, I will go so far as to say your enjoyment in heaven, your position in heaven, in some ways your relationship with the, the Savior in heaven. Heaven in many ways will be influenced by what you and I are doing today. Isn't that amazing? What's going to happen at this judgment? Well, point number one, the Bible says there's going to be a revealing of our works. What's going to be revealed? Paul says, every man's work. My work, your work. I'll not stand accountable for you. We'll not be grouped in together as Twin Oaks Baptist Church. You'll not be grouped in together as a family. You'll not be grouped in together as husband and wife. Every single individual that's a born-again believer will stand there individually before the, the Lord to be judged, to be examined according to what His work will be or what it was. How will it be revealed? Well, again, verse 13, notice what it says. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try, or the word there probably would be better, shall test or examine every man's work of what sort it is. The way that the Lord is going to verify what is actually good and what was useless is that he's going to put it through fire. Now, this illustration is not that hard to understand. Let's suppose that you had a, let's suppose that in your house, your house, I pray this will never happen to you, but let's suppose that your house burned down today. But you had, you had a lot of gold. A lot of gold jewelry or you bought gold or something like that. And your house burns down today. What's going to happen to all the wood structure of your house? It's going to burn up. Go to ash. But the gold there, what's going to happen to it? Is it going to burn up? It's still going to be there. Actually, what's going to happen is all the wood and all that other stuff, the temporary stuff is going to be, it's going to burn away, and all that's going to be left is the gold. And that's what Jesus is going to do. I'm going to stand before the Lord as an individual, as a husband, as a pastor, as a servant of God. I'm going to stand before the Lord, and He's going to take my entire life. Since I've been a Christian, He's going to take all that I've done, and the Lord is going to examine all that I've done, my actions, my attitude, my motives, everything. The Lord is going to examine that to determine what in my life was actually of a pure nature. What actually did I do for the purpose of Jesus Christ, for a love of Christ? What did I do for self? What I did for self is going to burn up. What I've actually done for the Lord is going to remain. And I'll give you in a nutshell, the Lord is going to reward me. The Lord is going to recognize that that gold, that gold of my faith, the Lord is going to recognize that and the Lord is going to reward me for that and eventually we'll send another message. But I'm going to turn around and I'm going to say, Lord, it was never me. It was just you. That good there, Lord, was just, and that's the way I'm going to turn around and worship Christ by the strength that he gave me to produce that gold. The Bible speaks a lot about fire in the Bible. It speaks about fire for punishment. The Bible also speaks about fire for purification. The Bible says that God purifies our faith through the fire of trials. When we, let, let me take, stop there just for a second. 
This person is running this race, and they're going through this, and suddenly in their race, they hit a very difficult point in their race. Suddenly they hit a point in their, their marathon, this race of their life, they hit a point where it seems like all uphill here. And they want to bail out. They want to quit at that time. But actually what God is doing at that time is that God is saying, you know, anybody can run on level ground. Anybody can run downhill. But I want to know who can run uphill. I want to know whose faith in me is so real and so true that they will continue to run the Christian race even though it seems like it's all uphill. And what will happen is, listen, if you were running a race, if you were out here, you were running that race today and you were trying to win that marathon and maybe you started out and you've got on, you know, I mean, you just, you know, ladies, you just happen to like that pair of shoes. You know, I mean, they just got a nice heel on them and they're cute and, I, I, I lived in a house full of women, okay? So it's just cute, and you just, you know, regardless, you know, if it puts bunions on your feet, you're going to look good, you know, while you're suffering. So you're running that race, and maybe it's easy to run that race in those high hills while everything is level, but suddenly you get to where it's uphill, and it's hard to run that race. What are you going to do with those high hills? You're going to kick those high hills off. You're going to kick those kind of, you're going to kick off any kind of encumbrance so that you can continue to run the race. You know what those high hills are? Those high hills are pride. Those high hills are selfishness. Those high hills are self-will. Those high hills are all these things of lust and greed and all of this anger. This, suddenly when you face that part of the race, you're going to realize it's not worth it and you're going to throw off that kind of stuff. And you may be just crawling up that hill, but if you crawl up that hill, the Lord's going to reward you for your endurance. So the next time you face a trial, that's why James says, brethren, count it all joy when you hit the difficult part of the race. Because behind the scenes, God is doing something great, not only now in your life, but in the days ahead. The Bible teaches us that the Lord is going to, He purifies our faith. The Bible teaches us that at the end, the Lord is going to purify our works. He's going to purify our life and look at all of our life to determine what was real and genuine and what was just false and make-believe. The Bible says that God is going to examine what we did and why we did it. You know, the Bible says that it's possible to have a false Christianity. Not everybody who claims to be a Christian is a Christian. It's possible to have a false Christianity. The Bible says it's possible to have a false worship. The Bible also says that it's possible to have false works. And I've really had to try to learn that lesson since I've gone into the ministry as a pastor. Because I have to constantly examine myself and scrutinize myself and determine it's not just what I'm doing, but why am I doing it? See, let's say, let's say that you could build a, I could build a church here of 10,000 people. That's not going to happen, but let's say that I could build a church of 10,000 people. Now the world may look at me and go, Wow. But you want to know something? The Lord's going to say, why did you do it? Is that why you did it? Is that why you sang that song? Is that why you gave that money? Is that why you... You know what Jesus said? If that's why you did it, He says, you better enjoy it while you're getting that because you'll get none of that in heaven. That's the only reward you'll ever get. So the Lord is examining my life. He will examine my life, not just the messages I preach, but why I preach them, even in my motive in it as I'm doing it to determine did I do it truly genuinely for Christ or did I just do it for myself therefore based upon that Paul says you and I as we go through life we need to make wise choices look again at verse 10 of this passage Paul says according to the grace of God which is given unto me Paul says as myself as a wise master builder I laid the foundation and now another person's building their own Paul's using the analogy of construction. He laid the foundation. Someone else is building a building on that foundation. But let every man, verse 10 says, let every man take heed how it is that he's building their own. For no other foundation can any man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment here quickly and examine the Apostle Paul's life. First of all, I want you to notice Paul's passion for the gospel. Paul says, I laid the foundation." What's the foundation? The foundation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was a, was a different kind of individual. Paul was a, an evangelist. Paul was a church planner. Matter of fact, Paul wrote to the Romans that he said, I tried to determine to go where no one else had ever gone with the gospel. 
Why? Because that was Paul's desire. That was Paul's passion to preach the gospel. Paul wanted to be used by God. And then Paul says, I, I, Paul would go into a new region. Paul would establish a church. He would win people to Christ. He would establish that church. But did, rarely did Paul stay there much longer than a year or so. And then Paul would go to a brand new region. But then that wasn't the end of that church. Then someone else would come along and they would build upon what Paul had established. You know, that's the way I look at my life through ministry. I'm just, I'm, I'm a part of this sequence. I'm a part of someone else. God did something else in your life. And then up in point in time, maybe God used multiple people up in your life. Now at this point in season in your life and in my life, I'm responsible to build upon the foundation that someone else has built upon. And one day I'll be off the scene. I'll be an old man and gone. And somebody else will come along and build as well. And Paul says, every individual is going to be held accountable for what they're doing, why they're doing it. So you need to be wise in the choices that you make. Paul, passion, he said, was actually, it was a gift from God. It was a gift of God's grace. He says in verse 10, he says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me. You know why I'm in the ministry? Because God called me. Because God put that desire in my heart. I don't know, I don't know where it came from. I've told you the little story. One day, and I'd been, I was, a, I was about 18 or 19 years old, I was 18, and I'd been living a pretty rebellious kind of teenage life, and, and really kind of had major conflict with my parents one night, and the next day I was with Dad, and, and we were driving somewhere, and I was kind of ashamed the way I'd been, but we were just, Dad was not lecturing, but God, Dad was really trying to help me get on track there, as any good Dad would. And then I said, out of the blue, I remember I said that day to Dad, you know, sometimes I wonder if God's calling me into the ministry. Now, it's a wonder I'm here because Dad almost wrecked the truck. When I, like, where in the world did that come from? He looked at me like, where? and I'm like, I have no idea. I'm serious. I can remember that day. A Saturday afternoon, I'm like, I have no idea. Well, I do now. It was the grace of God. Part of God's plan for my life. And God's got that for me, and He's got that for you as well. And He'll give us the grace. He'll give us the ability you remember the story we studied last week of Matthew 25? That the master, before he went on his journey, listen to me carefully, he gave to every one of his servants according to what he felt like his servant at that point in time could manage. If you're here today and you know that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want you to raise your hand. You know for a fact, beyond any shadow of a doubt, hold it up for a second, you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you are a born-again believer. You want to know something? then that raising your hand means that you're accountable. God has something for every single one of us to do. And you say, well, I don't know what it is. Well, it takes work to discover it. I didn't know either. And I was asked to teach Bible school, and so I was scared to death, but I did that. And I've just kind of followed God along the path, along the race. I don't know what's around the bend, but I know that God does. I know I'm doing today what I'm doing because God did something yesterday in my life and I know I'll be doing tomorrow because what I'm doing today. It's just a sequence of events that God is working in our life, using us for His own glory and so one day actually to even to give us glory. Look again, if you will, at verse 11. Paul warns them, he says, For other foundation can any man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation. That's, by the way, that's why if all the works burned up, that man will be saved because the foundation is still there. Now, verse 12. Here's the real question. The first question I asked you was that, are you born again believer? The second question is this. So how are you building? What are you building? You want to know something? Every one of us is building something. Adrian Rogers used to say, he said, some people would say, how many people are involved in your ministry? He said, everybody that's a member of this church is involved in the ministry. He said, some are building it up and some are tearing it down. But every believer is building some kind of building today by just getting up and what you're doing, your attitude right now, what you do today, next week, next month, you're doing something, you're building some kind of a building right now and you're building one of two different kinds of building. Verse 12 
Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, or precious stones, or wood, hay, or stubble, two different groups, every man's work shall be made revealed, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and this fire shall test every man's work to determine what sort of it is, whether it's gold, silver, and precious stones, or whether it's wood, hay, and stubble. I'm ashamed to say that a lot of my life has just been wood, hay, and stubble. Not nearly enough has been gold, silver, and precious stones. It's easy to be wood, hay, and stubble. It takes no effort. You know, the three little pigs didn't invent this, did it? The different, two different kinds of houses. Do you know when Jesus told there the parable at the end of Matthew 7, and he told about the wise man and the foolish man, and the foolish man the house on the sand, and the wise man the house on the rock? He's talking about salvation. He's talking about the Christian life. He's talking about when reality and the storm there is standing to be scrutinized before the all-knowing God. And will the house stand or fall? So what kind of house are you building today? Again, let me give you another comparison between the two different types of building materials. The gold, silver, and precious stones, we might say, are things that's for heavenly and eternal purposes. The wood hand stubble is just for earthly and temporary. The gold, silver, and precious stones are things that's pure and holy. The wood hand stubble is what's worldly and sensual. The gold, silver, and precious stones would be things that are precious and valuable. The wood hand stubble, useless and worthless. The gold and silver, things that it takes effort to obtain. The wood hand stubble, it takes no effort to obtain. Let me kind of rephrase this. Who are you living for? That's the question you, need, you and I need to ask, answer today. What is your life about? Is it about get all you can and can all you get? Is it about yourself? Is it about where you want to go and what you want to do and what you want to wear and how you want to decorate your body and what you want to say and the music you want to listen to and the entertainment? Is it about how you can make money and spend it? Is it about all of that? Is it about yourself? If it's about yourself, the Bible says it's wood, hay, and stubble. And when you stand before the Lord, do not expect any type of reward. Verda McGee said there are going to be a lot of Christians on this day of judgment that's going to smell like they came out of a fire sale. The stench of the smell of smoke is the only fragrance they're going to have because their life is just going to just, what all they did, all this money they made and all this they did and all this anger they held on to and all this stuff that they bought and they wore and they did it because they thought they could do it. You can't tell me what to wear. You can't tell me how to dress. You can't tell me how to talk. Well, I, I, I can't make you do anything. Can I tell you something? One day, when you and I stand before the Lord, the Lord's going to tell us. The Lord's going to address our dress, our language, our habits, our thoughts, our pocketbook. The Lord is going to examine every detail of our lives to determine what it was done for. What did we invest our life in? And the people who invest their life just in this earth, the Bible says they'll just burn up. But you want to know something? Here's an amazing thing. There's going to be some people that's going to be there that day that earthly speaking, they just nothing. But yet, they're going to have a treasure pot of full of gold and silver and precious stones because they lived their life for Jesus Christ. And those, that's why the last shall be first. You see, the first on this earth are the people who's got it all. They're winning the earthly race. And so they look like they're out in the lead. But all they're doing is wood, hay, and stubble. But it's this person at the back who just plodded along. And part of the reason they were at the back because they chose the place of a servant. See, I stand before the Lord one day. Two pastors stand before the Lord one day. The Lord's not going to say, okay, let's examine. All right, this guy, you had, you had ten times more people in your church than you did, so you must have been ten times better of a pastor. Now, the Lord may say, you know, you had ten times more people, but it was all about you. But this guy right here, I gave him 45 people, and he was faithful. 
You know, this is a silly little thing. I used to have dreams, these kind of dreams. I had this, I've had this dream several times. I've had this dream sometimes on a Saturday night. This is dumb. And I would come in here and there's like four people in church that day. And I'm kind of thinking, four people? And I, first time I had that dream, I, I, after I, the Lord, I, I woke from that dream, I sat there and I thought, and the Lord says, so Terry, what difference does it make if it's four or 400? That's not what it's about. It's about what the message I gave you. And so I determined that on that day, and I've experienced this many, many times. You're looking into part of my life right here. I determined that it didn't matter if it was 400 or four. I was going to preach with the same passion. I was going to do the same thing. And you know what's really the amazing thing? Almost every time I have that dream, it's one of those Sundays, it's like people are hanging off the rafters. But it's the Lord wanting to know, why am I doing what I'm doing? Lastly here, the rewarding of our works. Look again at verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Let me stop there just for a second. What is this fire, do you think? The Bible doesn't say exactly, so I'm just guessing. What do you think this fire is that the Lord is going to use? Well, in Revelation chapter 1, when John the Apostle saw the glorified Lord, and he looked into the eyes of the Jesus what did he see? What were the eyes of Christ like? Like a burning fire. What does that mean? You know what I think the judgment is going to be? I believe that it's going to be when the, my eyes meet the eyes of the one who has, still has the nail-pierced hands. It's when my eyes meet the eyes of the one who gave it all. It's when I look him and he looks me square in the eye and I don't think that Jesus is going to have to say a thing. I don't think that the process of, I don't think I'm going to carry a truckload of works up there. I think that when my eyes meet the eyes of Jesus, the eyes of Jesus will penetrate down into the very deepest part of my being and he will not have to say a single word because both he and I will know the truth. He'll know the reality. The fire, I believe, is the pure, burning, penetrating gaze of the one who gave it all and who knows it all, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, every man's work that shall abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. Any man's work shall be burned, earthly stuff. He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Let me tell you one quick little story, and I'm done. Many, many years ago, back in the 19th century, there was a missionary by the name of C.T. Studd, S-T-U-D-D. C.T. Studd was a, born into a very wealthy family. He was a cricket player who won championships in that day. And that was back in the, in the 19th century, but he was the athlete of that day. He had money, he had prestige, he could do anything, go anywhere he wanted to go. C.T. Studd accepted the Lord as his Savior, but he didn't live for the Lord. He, like most teenagers and young adults, he got caught up in this world. But along the way, C.T.'s brother, George, died. C.T. wrote this. He felt like the Lord said to him, What is all the fame, the flattery worth when a man comes to face eternity? C.T. Studd then said he had to examine himself, and he said, I determined that I was just in an unhappy, backslidden stage. He wrote this, I know that cricket would not last, that honor would not last, that nothing in this world would last, but it was only the worthwhile living for the world to come that would last. So C.T. Studd left his father's fortune he left his fame as this cricket player representing England and he went to China to be a missionary. And he gave the rest of his life as a missionary. And he wrote a little poem that's called Only What's Done for Christ Will Last. Two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind will not depart. Only one life will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life the still small voice gently pleads for a better choice. 
the enemy's selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to leave and God's, to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I hear the call, I'll know as say, "Twas worth it all. Read those last two lines with me. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Do you believe that? If we believe that, it would change the way we're living. If we truly believe that, there would be some major changes in a lot of our lives. 